Hey family, welcome to Life on Side B. This is Josh. Today, Ashley Grant and I are talking about shame. Shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. We're talking about shame related to being LGBT, as well as shame that we experience related to things that we've done. And how do we combat that shame? I think relationship and community are part of the the tools that God uses to, to dismantle shame in our lives. This turned out to be a really vulnerable episode for all of us. Also for our patrons, after we recorded this episode, we ended up staying on just for a few minutes to talk about some fun things and share some more stories. So on our Patreon page, there's actually an extended version of this episode just for you guys. So go over there and check it out. And with that, let's head into the episode. How are you guys doing? Good. <sighs> Grant's slowly dying. <laughs> <laughs> I hate being indoors so much. My brother and his wife came to my mom's house today, and they're quarantined because they were in California, but they just came, parked in the driveway, we handed them a tray of food, they stayed. You know, a few feet away from us, we talked for a little while, and they went home. Ugh. Mm. It's painful. My mom is hating it. The holidays for my mom are so important. Yeah. Yeah, this is just a weird weekend. I oh, talked yeah. with my roommates last night. Because all of us were just... Just felt off. Kind of going into Good Friday. Right. And couldn't really put... Uh, a name to it and so we finally decided to just drive around <laughs> yeah bit, just to get out of our house didn't get out of the car and just kind of like it just feels weird to go into the weekend and knowing all of the plans you would have had but can't do mm -hmm. yeah yeah and in in st louis it's like just cold enough that like going outside for an extended amount of time would not be fun and so I have been going to the park and doing exercise adjacent things. I mean, I'm very not <laughs> fit, but I've been trying to jog. And that's been really great because there's been warm weather. But now I'm sort of stuck indoors. And so the high point of my day was getting groceries. <laughs> Sometimes. <so> <laughs> Oh, I am there with you. Yeah. Uh, like yesterday, the highlight of my day was I actually went out and I got a McFlurry. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This morning before we started cooking, I went to like the pharmacy just to get some Easter candy because I hadn't done that yet. And it was like, I got to go do this this morning. And I'm like, I'm just going to go myself yeah. and then get back in the car and then come home and it was gone for five minutes and i was like i was like yeah i went to jelly beans yeah yeah i went to the grocery store specifically to get stuff for green bean casserole because i feel so unmoored from the calendar i'm like i know that mm. this is good friday <laughs> i i know that i should be doing easter related things and I have to have a green bean casserole for Easter, or I'm I'm not going to recognize that it's Easter. <laughs> uh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, and one thing I was thinking about is in the midst of all of this, what's one thing that's given you guys life right now through all of this? Like, what's one thing? I mean, something you're doing. It might be something like you were talking about going to the, going to work out in the park or something, or something you're watching. Mm -hmm. Um, honestly, I'm glad that I was able to actually get into my home workouts because my mom has a little room set up and I'm like, I'm not going to like this. It's, it's, it's not going to be challenging enough. I'm going to be in a little room. I'm not going to know what I'm doing. 
But after a few days and I had wrote out my little plan and I was actually able to like get into it and I was like, this actually works. So it's like part of my day I've been able to bring, Mm. it's been able to bring normalcy to my day. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Grant? Um, What's something helping giving giving you life? (laughs) Uh... Future Nostalgia, the latest Dua Lipa album, <laughs> uh. has been on repeat. It's so good. It's so clever. It's perfect. Um, so I've been listening to that as I've been going to the park. I've also been gardening. I got some seeds from the Dollar Tree and some pots and put them in oh, my windowsill. <laughs> um, yeah. And so it's cute. I've got some some plants um and then some of my friends and i have been watching netflix together uh on netflix party um Mm -hmm. which is free and it's so so great i mean the netflix isn't free i take that from my parents (laughs) but uh netflix party (laughs) is free and we've been watching uh a series called unorthodox I think I saw the trailer it? for it. Ooh, um, no. I vaguely remember it. Yeah. It's about this uh, young woman who like runs away from her Hasidic mm-hmm. Jewish community in Brooklyn. And it's her like, I don't know, escaping from this really sheltered life. And it's so dramatic. <laughs> it's so much. But me and my friends have been watching that. So that's been probably the most interaction I've had with people besides my roommates. Yeah. Yeah. What about you? Uh, on one side, I've been, I kept up and finally last night watched the f- series finale of Schitt's Creek. <gasps> I haven't watched it yet. <laughs> yeah. I won't share spoilers cause I know many people. I'm going to cry. <laughs> But it, can I just share for anyone who has not watched it yet? It is a very satisfying ending. Okay. But be prepared because you will feel all of the feels. All of I'm, them. I'm just going to be a puddle, aren't I? Oh, absolutely. Ugh. Absolutely. Like, I watched the series finale with a few people who have actually never watched the show. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> How dare you? I. It was, I was trying to get them to watch Schitt's Creek. So we watched the series finale together and even they liked it. So that was good, but it was also kind of sad because I'm like, well, now I don't have any more to watch Yeah, for the rest of this time. So (laughs) that's been, but that's been good so far. Um, I've also been really fascinatingly rewatching the show Will and Grace, not the new one, but like the old original. Yeah. Yeah. And I forgot how much I loved that show growing up because it was one of those shows. It was like that first real like primetime show that Mm -hmm. had a prominent gay character. Yeah. Gay characters. It's a milestone. Oh yeah. I remember growing up and like that would actually come across on the TV when my parents didn't realize that it would just like kind of the TV would just go from show to show, not realizing. And then Will and Grace would come on and I would watch it. And I was like, Oh, gay people. (laughs) <laughs> and um so i've actually been binge watching it lately so that's been great oh wow the last thing i would say more of a christianese answer has i've had the song the blessing by carrie job oh the yeah and that she released with elevation church um that has been like my anxiety calming song hmm. that i keep listening to whenever anxiety comes up and i i love that so those are a few things and yeah. and that have been kind of keeping me going through all of this. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you guys are here. Glad we get to do this together. Mm-hmm. Me too. Right. Yeah. Today we're going to talk about shame and self-esteem. You know, nothing, yeah. nothing deep. And Something profound. light. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We're having, you know, having an appetizer conversation now. <laughs> um, and this has been a topic I have been really 
interested to get to because as much as really anyone would like to say that it's not a part of their life, I think everyone deals with shame. Yeah. And, you know, gay, straight, bi, male, female, Mm -hmm. black, white, Latina, whoever you are, like you deal with shame. Yeah. In some way or form. And especially when you're looking at how shame uniquely affects us in the areas of sexuality and gender identity. I guess I just wanted to start off asking you guys, how would you define shame, especially in relationship to sexuality and gender identity? I think, I think maybe Brene Brown said this. She says a lot of wonderful things, but she described um, shame as the feeling that I am wrong as opposed to guilt, which is like the feeling that I've done something wrong. So when I think of shame, I think the the kind of images that come to mind are um, like being embarrassed, like mm-hmm. your reputation has been um, has been hurt by by something or um, I think the weirdly the image that comes to mind is like having a stain <laughs> mm. um, that you're embarrassed by, but you you can't get out. You can't get the stain out. So yeah, right. that's yeah, that's what comes to mind for me. I think I was thinking of the same um, definition actually. Mm-hmm. Give me one second. I know I was just reading something about this the other day, and I have the book on my desk. Give me yeah, like go ahead. Go ahead. In the meantime, Grant, you're amazing. Just letting you know. <laughs> hey, you're amazing. <laughs> uh, I'm you. sorry. There also might be a child crying. No, it's fine. Um, mm. So I have decided to cover myself with a thick blanket um, <laughs> to block out the noise, mm-hmm. um, which Don't hopefully worry. will work. <laughs> Don't I worry at all. I saw it with the door closed. Oh. Yeah. Wait, you, wait, you record this in your closet? Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> Think about the irony of that. Oh, yeah, it's, 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 the irony is. I'm, it's so oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I'm sitting on the floor of a kid's room in an Airbnb with Nemo on the wall, as well as Do- uh, Dorothy. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Wait, yeah, that's intense. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> anyway, Ashley, go ahead with your quote. I think, yeah, it's actually the book I was reading. He was actually also quoting Brene Brown. Okay. It says Ooh. that um, guilt and, you know, opposition to that can be a positive and helpful motivator in a person's quest for transformation, but shame rarely produces healthy outcomes. And this is a direct quote from her. It says, shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Shame is the fear of disconnection. It's the fear that something we've done or failed to do, an ideal that we've not lived up to, or a goal that we've not accomplished makes us unworthy of connection. I'm not worthy or good enough for love, belonging, or connection. I'm unlovable. I don't belong. Wow, that's good. And I feel like so many of the things you can relate to. Yep, that hits hard. The different things of sexuality in just so many different ways. Yeah, yeah. I think that's from my process of figuring out and dealing with shame. I think that's the biggest key definition of shame, especially compared to guilt, is shame Mm -hmm. attacks your identity of who you are. Right. Guilt can go after what you've done, Mm -hmm. but shame, whether it's about something a part of us or something we've done, attacks even just because I've done this, I am now this, or, um, yeah, and I think obviously that that affects, that relates so much. I know even with me with the, the issue of sexuality is you begin to see yourself as less than. Yeah. Saying I am less than and I am feeling shameful of who I am because of who I'm attracted to. Yeah. Um yeah, it, I, I well go ahead. 
it reminds me, I think, I think Wes Hill was talking about this at one point and some, some spiritual leader in his life, I can't remember the exact phrase they used, but said something like, you're just a little bit more broken than everyone else. Um, mm. In describing I remember that. his sexuality. And I was just, I mean, I was kind of shocked by how brutal that sounded to me. <laughs> Um, wow. because such a painful, because it feels so true. I mean, I don't think anyone has said something that, that directly to me, but I think that's the mm -hmm. experience I've had yeah. in a lot of places is that everyone is broken sexually, but, but you are especially broken, broken in a really mm -hmm. special way that no yeah. one else is. Yeah. That's, I think that that really gets to the heart of especially in um when dealing with the shame in relationship to sexuality and gender identity is is that feeling of just being more broken like yeah we're all broken yeah. and, and we we throw that term around really a lot of oh everyone's broken and then sometimes struggling with that feeling that either that you we put ourselves or that the church puts us mm -hmm. as just another degree of brokenness yeah. below everyone else yeah would either of you be up for sharing about maybe how shame has played a part in your life and maybe more specifically in your journey with sexuality, mm -hmm. gender, faith? You want to go first, Ashley? <laughs> sure. Um, I think, what was her name? Um, she was side B for a long time. Like first she worked with Exodus specifically. Oh, she wrote yeah. for Spiritual French Baton. Julie then, Rogers. Uh, Julie Rogers. Yes. Right. Yeah. See, we all had it. <laughs> I remember reading. No, it was, I think it was an interview for her that I listened to. It was like a really old one. Or it might have been her, her um, when she did the Q ideas or something like that. Mm. But I remember her, her saying something about herself when she was younger she was in college it was like probably around the time she was quitting the exodus thing and going in more into side b thought was that she said she had tried her entire life just not to be gay mm. but she was mm. and i think i mentioned something like that with the interview me and me and grant did was that i had never really specifically thought it like that but I remember uh, that part had, that part that she said always stuck with me because I remember my thing was always like not wanting to seem or look the part. Mm. Like that was just that that was a big thing for me, whether it was conscious or unconscious, because of the underlying truth. Because for a long time it wasn't even about that. It became that later. Because before it was just like. That's, you don't want to look like that. That's not what you want to seem like. You don't want to give the wrong impression because that's a bad impression to give. It's a bad idea to give about yourself. Later, when it became more about an underlying truth, and I was trying to give off this healed persona mm -hmm. that I had to also stay away from that idea that people could have about me. So, and I've always been a person that I always said, I don't care what anybody thinks about me. And I, get that to an extent I get that from my mom and everything but I never wanted I did care about what people thought about my character it wasn't so much that like I cared if you like me or not you can not like me but I still need you to know that I'm a good person mm. and for a long time the way I had it connected was that if you thought I was gay you thought less of me and didn't think I was a good person which very well may be true because a lot of people are like that, but it took me a very long time to come to a place. It's like, they may think I'm gay. They are right. Mm. They may think I'm less of a person, but I am not. Yeah. Mm. And that takes a whole lot of mental gymnastics. Yeah. 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 I think one of the, one of the ways that I coped with being made fun of 
like frequently throughout high school uh, was to deny that I was gay. Because even for me, <laughs> the idea that I could be gay was something that I, that was unsalvageable. Like there's nothing good about it. So when people would make fun of me for being sensitive or feminine or, or anything like that, I would say like I could, in my mind, my, my rationality was I can be those things and not be gay. Because gay was the worst thing that I could be. And so I would, I would try, and, try and talk about how I could be a man, I could be a straight person and still be sensitive. Um, so even, even in trying to defend myself from being made fun of, I think I had fallen victim to a lot of the lies, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally get that. Me, it was also not, not only for people to think of me of less as a person, to an extent, because I grew up being a tomboy, and that's a very common thing where I live, and no one bats an eye about it, but you grow out of it, you know? And mm-hmm. as you get older, just, you know, there's nothing wrong with someone saying that, well, you're less girly than her, or less feminine than her, but just the way they would make it sound is if you were almost less of a girl, and me, that was very, very conflicting. So it, to me, it was like, well, if me, if, you know, being gay means I'm less of a woman or something. And it took me a long time to really struggle with that when people would say like, well, you dress like a guy or, you know, you act like a guy. And then for a lot, it, when I was started getting into probably like my mid twenties, I'd be like, no, I, I act like myself and I am a woman. Therefore I act yeah. like a woman. I do not look like a guy just because I'm wearing girls clothes. If anything in guys clothes, you can definitely tell I'm still a woman. Because they don't fit me like they're going to fit you. Yeah. I got things you don't yeah. got. You know, it's like, don't. It's it's just that thing that people use to kind of put you in a box because that nonconformity makes them uncomfortable, I guess. Mm. But just the whole, in and of itself, having to be comfortable it's like, I think I said this a bunch of times, like I've struggled more with the idea of my own femininity than I have with my sexuality. If anything, my sexuality is mm-hmm. a much more recent develop in my consciousness than the other. Because my mm-hmm. entire life trying to fight for my definition or my presentation of my femininity being different than other people's and sexuality played into that Mm. because it's like am i still a woman if i like women doesn't that make me more like a guy you know and all those different factors that go into that and trying to figure out Mm. what all that meant for me and it's like no i am i am me coming into myself accepting it's like me is like the only thing i remember being younger i was like i just want to be you know a woman and then i am one so it's like an odd thing to think but all Mm. those different subtle shamers that are part of culture and society that tell you what makes you one thing and what makes you another thing and when you don't fit into those stereotypes or into those boxes it means you're less or you're something else Mm. And to have to learn to truly yeah. ignore that or embrace or find your balance in that, it is a lot of a lot of work. I think too, in this is this might be across the board, but our idea of what being a man is in many of our cultures and mm-hmm. or being what a wom- being a woman, what being a woman is is so wrapped up in having a relationship with a person of the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like we oftentimes really lack an imagination for what it could be like to be a man or be a woman without having to have a partner Mm -hmm. of the opposite sex. Heterosexuality Mm -hmm. and masculinity and femininity are so wrapped up together. 
So pursuing pursuing celibacy or um, or even like having a, a different gender presentation really it it implicates all of that <laughs> and it, it makes people ask a lot of questions. There's this other experience I had in college that really I think distills a lot of my experience of shame. Um, and I think this is probably, this might be one of the most painful moments of my life. <laughs> um, but I, I remember I had, a, I had some feelings for one of my friends and I thought the way to handle that, um, because I knew that he, he didn't reciprocate um, and I didn't want to um, act out on it um, in a way that's inconsistent with what I believe. Um, and so I thought the best way to handle this would be to channel all that energy I had into serving him and, and caring for him well. And I thought, Grant, you're doing such a great thing. Like you're really, if you're really handling this in a really mature way. Um, but later on, he, someone told him that I had developed feelings for him. I'd shared um, in confidence with someone and they had told him. And then he met with me to talk about how he felt about learning about my feelings. And he, as he was describing how uncomfortable it made him feel, <laughs> I just felt ugly and repulsive mm -hmm. and so unworthy. I just wanted to hide just profound shame. And I think that experience is what comes to mind most immediately for me when it comes to how, how shame has been a part of my experience as a as a gay man i can i can totally <laughs> i can totally relate to that experience i know in my own life i've experienced shame like ashley as as you were saying i definitely struggled with the idea of feeling less than other boys um mm -hmm. you know because i mean i even in in elementary school, I was made fun of saying that God made a mistake when he made me a boy. Um, that was mm. one of the things that kids would say. And, and that sticks with you as a kid. And yeah. me being mm. a competitive person that I am, decided I was going to show everyone that I, <laughs> I could match up to any guy. <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. the very reason why I can hold right. myself up in sports and hunting and mm. all of these different things because i was like i am not going to let anyone think that i am less than but at the same time something that i learned later on was um that in some ways part of that was a mask mm. that you know i i've come to learn that yeah. a lot of shame is a, about a fear to be seen a yeah. fear to really be seen and known and mm -hmm. that we hide behind the shame because we believe into that, you know, that lie of being less than. I know another area for me that's, especially in the area of sexuality, I mean, so in my, in my life, I, I have gone back and forth in the area of feeling less than because of the very fact of being gay. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been, I've spent so much time on, on all the different sides, being affirming, non-affirming, ex-gay, <laughs> side B, that it's hard to tear, tear apart all of those different sides of yeah, the up and down sure. <laughs> struggle of like what came out of being in reparative therapy and right. then kind of going to the other side of being very open, affirming and, um, and everything. But I know one of the hard, the, one of the hardest parts for me was especially when I started becoming side B was before I became side B, I was very sexually active. Um, I don't have a, like, to be honest, I don't have a final number of the amount of people that I've slept with. 
Hmm. And um, because it's, I, I stopped keeping track. And um, I really, I even went through therapy, I went through counseling for sex addiction. And that's even before I became non affirming. That wasn't about side A, side B issue. Even while side A, I went through sex addiction counseling and, and kind of having this, mm-hmm. this fear that I couldn't be loved by God. Mm. Um, yeah. That because of, because of everything that I had done and because of all the situations I had been in, I think especially getting into purity culture you know, and, and growing up in purity culture where, you know, you hear all of these, um, these things that the, the youth groups and college ministries would tell you about the rose that gets passed around so many times. And then it's like a wilted rose that no one wants. And you're like, well, <laughs> guess I yeah. am that rose <laughs> and oh. going, cause I have lived that. And so it was really a process for me and I, and it's still a struggle for me at times of kind of having to fight against that feeling of being like feeling like used goods in many ways and having to remember that I am loved by God and that I can be loved. You know, one thing that I, in preparation for this, I didn't get to go to the workshop at Revoice, but thankfully it's on the YouTube channel, which was Ty Wiss's um, oh, yeah. workshop on sh- shame. I was watching it because I was like, I was so sad I didn't get to go. And I love one thing that he said, which said, he said, God doesn't call us to stop being gay, but he calls us to stop acting like, acting like orphans. Hmm. And Oof. Yeah. Wow. You got to give me a few minutes after that. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. Yeah, that one, that one. And that even just impacted me personally. Listening to it was like, wow. Um, I feel like so much of that shame pushes us to act like act as orphans, to act like we don't have a father and to act like we're alone. And that's been kind of how it's yeah. been in in my life. And, you know, I was even kind of then reflecting, and this is where I would like to get in a little bit of Bible stuff. Cause I started thinking about like, what does the Bible say mm. about shame, you know? And, yeah. and obviously the first place I was thinking about one of my, being the biblical studies nerd that I am, my first <laughs> question in these kind of things is where was the first mention of this topic? Yeah. And of course I went to Genesis two where it's in Genesis three, where Genesis two, Adam and Eve are naked and unashamed. And then mm-hmm. Genesis three is when shame enters and they clothe themselves. And, and again, they try to hide because they don't want to be known by God. And it was just interesting to see that, like the connection in Genesis two and three of um, once shame enters for what they've done, they hide and they try to cover themselves. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to hear your guys' thoughts on that or if you had any other thoughts on you know mm. shame in the Bible. I think as I was thinking about that passage um, where Adam and Eve um, hide because they're ashamed of being naked, um, I think maybe oftentimes it's been easy for me to, to gloss over that and think like, oh yeah, I'd be ashamed of being naked too. Like that's just a basic human thing. I, I, my light clothes, I, I don't want to be naked in front of other people. But I really think it's deeper than that. And I think it's not that they were ashamed of nakedness per se. I think it's they were ashamed of being seen for who they really are. Yeah, um, exactly. There was, there was nothing in between who they really are and the eyes of God. And so they wanted there's this element in shame that appears all the time that like wanting to hide wanting to cover cover up um so i think that that's like the the kernel the core of that that particular story um when it comes to shame it always like stuck with me and to an extent even to 
like wonder like why God asked them what he asked them like afterwards he's like who told you mm. that you were naked and I always feel like that I'm like that's such an odd question to ask if they are obviously naked <laughs> you know yeah but I think it's more like this is the way it's always been who told you it was a problem mm. like you didn't have to hide from me before why do you feel that now you have to hide yourself mm. from me yeah you know i never Cause... thought about it that way because it's like yeah naked wouldn't have been even been a concept because clothes had never <laughs> existed existed <laughs> it's like there was never anything that had to come between us before why why do you need that now and it does come from something that they did do but this is the first time that they had done something like that. There's just so many firsts wrapped up in that that it's hard to comprehend. They had, you know, they had never disobeyed. There had been no wrongdoing up until that point. They had not, you know, not listened. Mm. And now that they did, they didn't know what to do with themselves. They were too young in their understanding to even grasp that they had done something wrong and that they were not wrong as a whole. Mm. They figured that they needed to be fixed. And God even, like I said, it, it was more so that of their grasp, their understanding, their youth as a species almost to an extent that God was like, well, if that's what you feel like what you need, I'll give you better clothes. Mm -hmm. for now yeah i heard a very fascinating theory about genesis 3 okay right or wrong um i love my old testament academics and how they think of these things um one and and again i'm not saying that this is exactly it but for the sake of this con for this com conversation mm -hmm. i think it's actually a pertinent idea is one scholar, um, and I can't even remember who said it, that he didn't feel that Adam and Eve's exile from the garden was necessarily an automatic because they ate from the tree, but that mm -hmm. God and Adam and Eve's conversation was God trying to bring them to a state of repentance and bringing them back into relationship with him. But if you hear in the conversation with them, they hide and they blame, but they never repent. They never mm -hmm. try to come back to him. Oh yeah, that's true. They there's never this sense of plea, like we want to go back <laughs> to this, but a matter of we're going to hide and we're going to put it on other people instead of this response of we did this wrong and and we but we want mm -hmm. to continue to walk in mm -hmm. and almost this like the idea would be that this that God's questions are him trying to pull them back. Like, don't leave, <laughs> don't hide yourselves. Like, yeah, like, let's keep walking together, but that they're pulling away. Mm -hmm. And then kind of like you said, it's like, well, if you're going to cover yourselves, I'll give you something to cover, you know, your shame. I think the point of that, you know, whether or not that applies to Genesis three, I think that that idea really hit me of that, in all in all of the cases throughout the Bible and throughout history, God seems to always be the one calling us into relationship with Him, calling us to be known by Him. Yeah, and it's us that pull away. It's us that try to put up something that so we're not known, either by Him or by other people. And I think that many, I think sometimes even as we're trying to deal with our shame, that like. I think sometimes we can even use our faith or even our sexual identity as a way of covering up our issues mm -hmm. with shame mm. of being able to say like, like I know for me for a while, you know, there, there's this kind of sense of when kind of related to coming out that when a person comes out, it, it goes to this obvious extreme where everyone needs to know, Yeah, <laughs> you know, where you just go to your, like you're in the supermarket and you're just like, move, I'm gay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. and, and then you kind of mellow out from that. And, and also I think on the Christian side, there can be that way when that person becomes a Christian, 
Oh yeah. Um, and and I think that in some ways, it's a way of dealing with shame. Yeah. Uh, at least I think from my perspective, it was of that immediate where holding people at a distance of putting that part of me in their face. Mm. Um, I wanted to see what. Yeah, I mean that's just been like my. I, looking back on my walk with Christ and my journey as a gay man has been seeing how even as I became, began to accept my sexuality and come to faith that sometimes I would use the fact of being Christian or sometimes I would use the fact of being gay as just another way of holding people at arm's length from yeah. really knowing me as an individual. Mm. I don't know. What do you guys think? That was a very like wordy. What was the question? <laughs> um. Oh, okay. I guess the question. Do you think? Like I do. Yeah. Do you think there are any ways that faith or sexual identity can sometimes cover up our issues with shame? Hmm. Always. Like, have you ever seen? It's like it's like with kids. Like they they don't want to eat their dinner, so they're screaming. So you pull out a bouncy ball and throw it at the wall and scream the word distraction. And all of a sudden they have no idea what they're crying in the first place. So it's like <laughs> to an yeah. extent I've noticed that in, in different moments of my life, because I am such an introverted person. I am such a private person that what I would do is I could take some big sounding thing, a big secret, have you will. And it, I want to say make that person feel like I'm confiding in them. I am, but I'm distracting you with larger details so that you can't really see where I'm actually at. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would be like, I could, I could pull out like a pornography issue that I had like years ago and being like, and this is the steps that I'm taking and this is what I do with this. And they're like, you know, like I said, they, 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 they feel like this person is opening up and I am opening up. Like I said, I don't want to make it sound like I'm completely manipulating them, but I knew what things I could talk about, what things I was not ready to talk about, which ones to talk about, to make them forget about the ones that I wasn't ready to talk about. Mm -hmm. So you can use that in, like you said, just about anything, even in, like you said, with your faith, a lot of times we'll feel like a lot of people that come to Christ, depending on at what stage of their life they come to Christ or where they were at when, you know, they finally did. To to an extent, even though we know we came to God and he accepted us through grace and had nothing to do with our merits. Once we finally do accept Christ, we want to start doing a lot of good things, even though we don't realize it's in the mindset of trying to make up for who we were before hmm. to prove to everybody that we really are good people now mm -hmm. where it's like, That's a good point. you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's just this big, and in, in my opinion, almost a, a way of distracting ourselves and other people from the depths of ourself. Yeah. 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 It's almost like sometimes we, uh, kind of like when people share their testimonies or when, you know, people talk about whatever we, we show just enough that lo it looks polished. Yeah, exactly. But then we leave out the messy parts. That was my issue for the longest time about talking about my sexuality. I did not want to talk about it until I could say I used to, or I could talk about it in past tense. Mm. I in no way, shape or form mm. wanted to talk about it in present tense. Yeah. Because talking about it in past tense, it's you're glorifying God. You are, you know, showing what God has done in your life, um, all these types of things. It, it, it gets you a pat on the back to an extent. And again, that just sounds so yeah. manipulative. But oh, yeah. talking about it in present tense is going to get a very different reaction of these pitied looks, people wanting to... Not that there's anything wrong with prayer, but this very hands-on type of prayer that scares all three of us. And, <laughs> you know, because I remember, too, like one of the one time 
there was a leader that I I trusted a lot and still do. She just didn't really know what to do with this part of my life. And I remember when I first told her, like later on, she goes, you know, one day I want to be able to sit, you know, me and my husband, we want to be able to, you know, really pray over you about this or whatever. And like at the time, I didn't really even think about it. But later on, I'm like, oh, that's what they wanted to do. Well, that never happened to an extent. Not that I don't accept prayer, but I I don't think I could handle them trying to cast that out of me. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. And that that was like it was it was a very fear driven and shame driven thing of never wanting to speak about it in present tense. It was like if I'm gonna talk about this, it's gonna be in past tense because that's that's prettier. Like you said, that's more polished. Yeah. More accomplished. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Did you have any thoughts? Yeah, I think one of the the more important books for me over the past few years has been uh, Alan Downs' *The Velvet Rage*, um, which, if you're I listening and you want to process through some shame in your past and help you uh, break free of that and move forward, this is a it's not a Christian book, um, but it was really really helpful for me. And one of the things that um, he talks about in the book is um, he's focusing specifically on gay men, and he's saying that oftentimes we sort of split our lives into two very early on. Uh, And the person that we really are, we keep secret. (laughs) And then we create this facade um, that we're convinced will will receive praise and validation from people. And even after we come out later on in life and begin to process through some of that shame, that split, is still there. And so a lot of the validation that we receive from people for the things that we do um, and for the persona we've created, it doesn't actually reach who we are <laughs> because we still keep that that part of us secret. And I don't know, that that idea has just been really helpful for me uh, because I can I can try and convince myself that if I if I make myself an expert or if I um, if I speak really well, or if I'm really funny, or if I look really good, then I'll receive validation that hits me at my core. But it never does. And I think there's a long process of trying to integrate those two parts of my lives, my life, um, into one. So that's that's going to be a years long process. I mean, I just read that book less than a couple years ago but i think that's that's part of the process for me in in addressing shame is trying is reintegration um and another thing i this is is similar it's not necessarily about my sexual identity my sexuality but i think as i have as i have learned more about injustice as it relates to race and ethnicity. I think something I've had to process through is a lot of um, shame at being white. And even more specifically, (laughs) um, I haven't done any like genealogical research, but I mean, Hartley is is a very English name. I mean, sounds like a a fish and chips place. Like it's, it's very British. And so I think that even adds more shame because I think of the long history of colonialism <laughs> and slavery. Mm-hmm. And I think of, of all the shame that comes from being a part of that people. And I think part of the way that I've unhelpfully tried to process through that shame or try at least sweep that shame under the rug is I think, oh man, if I could just latch on to a different culture and make that culture my culture, then I won't have to identify with being white. And so I think part of, part of the sort of mental um, thing that happened was I, I latched on to LGBT history and culture and thought, oh, if I can latch on to this, I can make this my culture. Um, I can make this my history. And I won't have to deal with 
all the past stuff that I'd have to deal with if I just if I just consider myself white. I'm not advocating for this. This is this is more of a confession, if anything. This is not yeah. not helpful, but I think that's part of how I've um unhelpfully dealt with a lot of my shame. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can relate to so much of what you both said, you know, what you were talking about about the two identities. I I have 100% dealt with that. And, you know, something really frustrating for me with the two identities where you you have yourself that you hide and then you have mm-hmm. this polished version of yourself. And I remember I spent so many years trying to reintegrate them, those two parts. Mm-hmm. And I had finally gotten to a p- place where I was really happy that I was, I really felt like I was showing the real side of myself. And then it's been like, especially last year was really frustrating for me because I noticed that with different circumstances I'd put myself in and different people I'd put myself around, I had allowed myself to revert back to that. And it was kind of one of those things where you feel like you had dealt with something and you're like, crap, (laughs) this has to come up again. (laughs) And like, and, and realizing that sometimes it's not even just like, even if I deal with something, if you get around other people that are going to influence you to kind of revert back to that, how easy it is to get back into old habits Mm. of allowing yourself to have this exterior side that people see and, and then hide hide the real self behind behind that's behind closed doors and you know some of the things that i that i've dealt the ways that i've dealt with that kind of relate to what you were saying ashley about i i I want to do the same thing i wanted to talk in context of used to Mm -hmm. but going through one of the if there's any one thing i learned from addiction counseling was that they always tell you to talk about how um i have an addiction you don't talk about that i did i have even if you haven't drank in years even if you haven't done whatever in years you still talk about it in present tense because the addiction never stops so they used to always frustrate people when i say i have a sex addiction and it doesn't matter if it's been however long since i've slept with a man it doesn't change the fact that it's a daily decision and a Hmm. daily process to be able to keep that um and i'm i'm comparing i'm i want everyone to know in this in this point i'm not comparing the issue of um <laughs> i'm talking about my sexual addiction which is very separate from my gay identity <laughs> thank you for um, saying that <laughs> yes um absolutely but it also relates to um i talk about like my addiction there because on the side of being gay, I don't even know where I'm going with this. Um, this is a very raw part of my life. Um, because if you want to talk about going through something, um, something that's still not polished, this is, this is the side of it for me that I am still, still working through because I really struggle I I continually struggle with looking at things that I've done in the past, awful mm. things, and attributing it to me being an awful person. Mm. And it's not, this is yeah. not, I want to clarify, this is not about being gay. Yeah. Um, this, just because it, some of it deals with sleeping with some situations in which I slept with men, um, does not necessarily have to be with being gay. It's more of the other circumstances that surrounded those situations to the point that I've dealt with being haunted at night Mm. uh, by feeling like an awful person who doesn't deserve God's love and doesn't deserve the love of community because of, because of things I've done. And so having to come to that place of, allowing myself to be exposed before God and exposed before people, 
knowing 100% of everything in my life, things that I don't like people to know, and allowing those people to love me in the midst of that, you know? Um, yeah. And I say that because I know that we're mostly talking about shame surrounding like being gay and all of that, but you know, I, I know that there's, I, I wanted to share all of this because I know that there are multiple people listening who probably don't have the right. most simplest of history related <laughs> to sex. Yeah. And I wanted to also say that, that it's not even just about not having shame related to the very fact of being gay, but no matter what your sexual history is, that doesn't that doesn't disqualify you from the love of God doesn't disqualify me as much as sometimes I feel it should, but yeah, mm -hmm. I got a little bit into rambling. No, it's, it's no, that's good. It, it, it may be rambly in, in essence, but I think it does connect. And I think it is something that the, like almost no matter where you're at in, in beliefs, once you come to a point where you're ready to start talking about your sexuality because you're the sexual part of your sexuality will almost automatically come into question once you start mentioning one that mm -hmm. there's obviously always an automatic shame when it comes to sexual things or sexual behaviors almost be like the Santa Paul says, all mm -hmm. the other sins are outside of us, but these sins are in us to an extent. It's, it's more personal. Um, mm -hmm. there's, there's almost more shame when the two things come together because of just past baggage of how sexuality was treated and seen as a sex addiction. So many times people are very afraid to talk about one or both of them or for anyone to know that both things are part of their life. They want to talk about one or they want to talk about the other, but they don't want anyone to know that both of those things are part of their life because they're automatically mm -hmm. going to blame one on the other and it's going to make things more complex mm -hmm. and more weighty and more unhealthy for the person who's trying to get help from someone else and this is the, the direction they're guiding them in and the fear that comes with that of like if I tell them that I am a same-sex attracted person who also has sexual struggles are they going to throw both of those in the same bag? And when you do mm. throw both of them in the same bag, because you, like you said, as a side A person, you were trying to get help for a sex addiction that you had. So many times a person will want help for that, mm -hmm. this particular behavior that they're experiencing and their counselor or guidance person or leader, faith leader, is going to concentrate on their sexuality and it's like mm -hmm. it's it is a shame inducing thing because many times of like we talk about shame and fear kind of go hand in hand of that fear of how is this gonna go once i bring all of this to light so i don't think it's i don't yeah. think it's too out there for mm -hmm. you to have talked about that particularly i appreciate that yeah because and I, and I want to clarify that for everyone listening. I also don't want anyone to think that I'm using the term sex addiction just because I've slept with many guys, because that's not the definition of a sex addiction. Like the difference between sleeping around and like having a sex addiction is when you can't function normally without sex. Mm. That's when it becomes a sex addiction. And for instance, for me, like I got to a point where I had to have sex like three times a day in order to function. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, you have a lot of energy. Uh -huh, uh, you don't even want to know. Um, no, I don't. So, <laughs> so one of the things that I dealt with was when I left 
my affir- affirming beliefs and I left my boyfriend like I but I didn't know about side B so I went into ex gay therapy mm-hmm. and that even made it more confusing because kind of like you said was that I went to a ex gay counselor at that point and the sexual the quote unquote sex addiction was no longer just the fact that I my situation of how often I had sex with men and my reliance on sex with men just to function. Mm-hmm. Um, but it w- became the very fact that I was gay was my sex addiction yes. mm-hmm. and actually having to separate those two because that even then confused me more when I became side B of, so wait, when before I had dealt with this in this way, but then I had an ex-gay counselor telling me, no, the very whole fact that you are gay is a sex addiction. And I was like, no, <laughs> <laughs> those are two different nice things. Nice try. <laughs> Yeah, and and having to kind of separate those and separate the shame that came with those things. Because, again, I think that there's shame that we get over attributes of us. So, like, I think that there's the shame. But all shame kind of attacks who we are. It takes whatever happened and attacks who we are. And there's I think there's shame over aspects of us, like shame over our attractions. And then there's also shame over things that we've done. Both of those things end up attacking who we are. But then we have to find ways to confront them, you know? And yeah, I know we kind of dealt with a little bit, but how have you guys combated the shame in your lives? Hmm. Well, I think, I think because the primary consequence of shame is a loss of relationship or or another way to say that is shame stands as an obstacle to relationship. Um, I think the solution Mm -hmm. is relationship, or at least part of how to address shame. Mm -hmm. I don't think, I think maybe some people have advocated for a kind of just intense self-love to overcome shame. And I think self-love is so important. Um, But I also think that human beings are not created to be individuals unconnected from other people, but other people are actually what sort of constitute us as human beings. We're constituted in relationships. And so I think relationship and community is are part of the the tools to help that God uses to, to dismantle shame in our lives. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think I've been reading some Henri Nouwen lately. Um, he has a, um, there's a daily devotion with quotes from his books. Um, and Henri Nouwen talks a lot about um, being the beloved. Um, and so when he looks at the baptism of Jesus uh, and God the Father says, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased because we've been adopted uh, into the family of God, those words are for us too. Um, we are the beloved children of God. He is well pleased with us. Uh, and more than that, um, we're also beloved of other people. <laughs> um, there's a rich community, a fam- the family of God that we belong to. And I think that that is the resource that we need to draw from in order to dismantle shame's power in our lives. So community has been really important for me. Um, I think when I was probably like 21, like when I first admitted these things like to myself and to God and everything. And my big shame thing was like, I just had this very false idea in my head that if you've been a Christian for a certain amount of time, you're not supposed to deal with certain things. Like a seasoned Christian isn't going to deal with, like, big temptations. You're, you might be petty. You might mm-hmm. um, fall into church gossip or, you know, mm-hmm. things that we measure as small things, even though before the cross it is all equal. Um, I thought that you, you just shouldn't, because if you did, that means you weren't as grounded in the faith or in the spirit as you're supposed to be. 
And it was a very hard for me to accept that I still had struggles and temptations and that those temptations were towards women, you know, and, and again, a Julie Rogers quote, um, I'm gay. So if I make mistakes or have temptations, they're going to be gay mistakes and gay temptations. Um, Mm. (laughs) but it was very hard for me. And it was one of the first things that God really brought to my attention. He really made me read the epistles and everything to show me that there was no shame in being human to an extent because it says that when I started really reading the scriptures and seeing that it says nowhere the temptation will be taken away but that he gives us the spirit he doesn't take anything but he gives us something for it and that was extremely comforting to me and took some of that shame away for God to be like It's not because you did something wrong. This is just the way life is, but I've given you the tools that you need because it says that no temptation shall come to us that is not common to man. It says that if we walk in the spirit, we will not walk in the flesh. And that really released a lot of shame for me in that in the area of being ashamed of my struggles or being ashamed of struggles. And then years later, having found the side B community, like Grant said, community has been a very healing factor to see so many people. Because when you feel like you're the only one in any situation in life, it's just not helpful. It's not healthy. But when you can see a community of people struggling through something, working through something, you see Older people, younger people, people where you're at, people who were where you are, people who are where you want to get, um, working together. And like I said, I remember when I went to the first retreat, my entire life, I always felt like wherever I went, there was an expectation on me to be something. I'm the oldest of a sizable family. So there was always an expectation on me to be mature. There was an expectation on me to be this or be that. I'm a missionary. I work in ministry. There's an expectation on what you're, of what you're going to be like, you know, and coming into the community, I never realized how much those expectations weighed on me until they weren't there. When I came into the side Mm -hmm. B community on the retreat, I said, these, I bring nothing to the table except for our com- the mess that I have in common with everyone here. The common struggle, the common temptation, the, just the common, now I see more as the common experience of the common journey. But the fact that there were no expectations as to how I should be or as to who I should be, but that who I was, where I was at, was completely loved and held. And people wanted to help Mm. me not just in that area because sometimes when you go to leaders and you talk about your your journey with sexuality they always want to help you with that you know you go to them they're like how you doing with the with 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 that exactly yeah but i went into the side (laughs) b community and people asked me how my job was going (laughs) how my husband's immigration paperwork was going and i'm like you remember that I was like, you guys care about me, not just about this part of me, but the rest of me. We talk about comic books and music and Old Testament Bible study stuff. And and you also know this about me, but it's not like this heavy factor in either direction for you was something that I think one of like the the bigger healing factors for me in what is shame. And even though everyone's far, far away from me because I'm hundreds of miles from everybody, where I am, where it would seem that I am by myself, I carry that acceptance and love that you all have given me to be able to express myself and be myself where I am. 
That's so true. I think there's just, yeah, I, I think that that's where I found the greatest, just w the greatest ways to confront shame in my own life. I don't even want to say healing because I, I don't think that shame is necessarily something we automatically just overcome, but it's something that we continue to confront. Yeah. And, but the place that I have found to best confront shame has been in that place where I am completely known mm -hmm. by people and accepted. Mm -hmm. And like, there's nothing hidden, you know? And, and I, I think that it really comes down to that. Like, it's okay to be known as a person without the answers. It's okay to be known as a person who isn't maybe living up to the way that you want to live up to. Uh, it's okay to be known as a, as a person who has not met their goals yet. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's a, it's okay to be known as the very kind of person that you hate, uh, <laughs> because I found myself in the, in that place of having to show myself and reveal myself to people in my life as the very type of person that I hate. Um, in those moments where I'm like, crap, I am judging people right now. Mm -hmm. In the very way that I tell others not to judge others. The moment where I stop letting myself be known or just trying to hide parts of me because I want, I, I don't want to let people down or I feel like this is this part, I, I should have gotten this figured out. So I don't need to bring this up to anyone. That's the moment where shame begins to creep back in. And so as embarrassing as it is and, and as awful as it is, I have those people in my life who literally know everything. They, <laughs> they, <laughs> there ain't yeah. nothing they don't know because the moment I try to not have them know everything is the moment, like you said, those two sides of me go back. <sighs> well, this has been a good conversation, guys. Yeah. Thanks so much for all the good conversation and all the good questions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, this has been one that I've been very excited to have. So, um, I'm glad we have finally been able to do it. <laughs> <laughs> the pandemic couldn't stop us. <laughs> no, Rona could not get in the way. <laughs> <laughs> get out of the way, Rona. Miss Rona. Get out of the way, Rona. <laughs> All right, everyone, that's it for today. Thanks so much for listening, and stay tuned next week for another episode. Talk to you soon. Bye, guys. <laughs>